Good evening, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to take this time to welcome you to Live at Five. Listen, it's five o'clock and it's Wednesday, so I know you know exactly what time it is. It's time for Live at Five. I'm excited once again for these live questions that have been sent in to me that I get this great opportunity to answer for you live. Let's get directly into our first question. It says, what does the Bible say have to say about organized religions? Religions with an S. I like the question. Great question. What religions are actually started by men? You know, they're, they're started by men to actually either glorify mankind, very much like the Tower of Babel, or to glorify their version of who they think God is, their, their, their version of an acceptable deity. Now, faith in Christ is not a religion. Faith in Christ is actually a reality. You know, people who want a right relationship with, with God actually have accepted the testimony of Jesus. That's exactly what has actually happened when you look at Christianity, which is what separates it from a religion. We accept the testimony of Christ in concerning the fact that he is the only way to a right relationship with God. And being a part of a Bible-believing fellowship is commanded out of wisdom, not for rule-making or, uh, you know, or, or setting up what would be like just another religion. Being, in, being organized is never a bad thing. And nor does being organized mean that Christianity is simply just one of the many, many other world religions. God wants his people to gather together in fellowship. That's what we do as Christians. We gather together in fellowship. Let me tell you what the Bible says. It says, uh, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24, and then also 25. It says, let us consider one another so as to motivate to love and find works, not forsaking our meetings together. So when you look at this, one of the primary ways that we show love is that, you know, the, the world actually gets to see Christian love is that we actually love to associate with each other. Part of what we're doing is not developing a religion with a bunch of rules together, but we're exhibiting the love of God one to another, which is exactly what, you know, Christianity really is all about. You know, when the Bible talks about the fact that people should get together and worship, it doesn't teach that a person can go to heaven, nor does it teach a person uh, that a person can come to God because they are part of a religion, because they operate in a religious plan. Let me tell you again what the scripture talks about as it uses the very word religion. It says the religion that is clean and undefiled from the standpoint of our God and Father is to look after the orphans and widows in their tribulation and to keep oneself without spot from the world. So what do we get? To be approved by God, a person's religion must affect their life. So one of the things that separates Christianity from other world religions, for instance, and we'll use that word religion, is that true Christianity does not create a religion. True Christianity is not a part of religion. True Christianity will always create a lifestyle of faith in Christ. That's exactly what our faith is. So the Bible doesn't specifically talk about, uh, you know, uh, other world religions, but it does give you an understanding according to the word here in James 1 27, what true religion is. So if God is true, the Bible says that God be true and let every man be a liar, that, which means that all the other religions are man-made. They are not true, but a true faith, true religion is undefiled and it comes from a lifestyle not from a bunch of rules and regulations let's take a look at question number two and i hope that helps you with the, your first with the first question uh it says if the doctrine of predetermined salvation is true then everyone isn't really able to be saved you know one of the reasons why i love these questions is because you guys are thinkers you guys are really really thinking a lot about um you know what comes next how this works. And I think it's really important for young believers, uh, new believers, skeptical people to really begin to question and understand the nuts and bolts of, you know, Christianity. It's been around, you know, it's been here for such a long time. And some places it's watered down. There's some places that are calling people call themselves Christians that are actually are not. So it's important for you to ask these questions and it's important for you to get accurate answers. So I want to give you an, an answer to this question. You talked about, again, if the doctrine of predetermined salvation, which means salvation has been determined before we were even born, before we were formed in our mother's womb, who was going to be elected to be saved which is what you're talking about in predetermined salvation, um, it says if that's true, 
then everyone isn't really able to be saved. That offer for salvation isn't universal. All right, let's talk about that. Uh, yeah, you're right in, in a sense that it's impossible for anyone to actually be saved unless they're first elected by God. It is the Lord who predetermines before we're even formed in our mother's womb who we're going to be and whether we'll be saved. We, we were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of, the, of God's son, Jesus Christ. So those who have a relationship, and, and I'll put this in a nutshell so you'll understand that those who actually have a relationship with God, is because God chose to have a relationship with us and God chose to win us over. It's not has nothing really seriously to do with any works that we have done. Has no connection. His act alone is what saves us. No action of ourselves. But there is another sense in which actually everybody is capable of actually being saved or being redeemed, but everyone simply will not. Listen, let's talk about the nature of God. One of the things that we know about the nature of God is that it's the nature of God as we look at his call, his call to the whole world. You know, though we know that he selected Noah to be saved, he made sure that Noah made this call uh, for many, many, many years out to the people that there was an opportunity to be saved, even though he, God knew they would not accept it. Jesus comes and he offers the whole world this opportunity of salvation, even though he knows that everybody will not do it. God is going to call everybody, but he doesn't select or elect everybody and for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is that everybody doesn't want to be saved. Everybody doesn't want redemption. Everybody does not want this gift, free or not. And God is simply not going to force uh, this gift of salvation on us. Matter of fact, let me put it this way. And, and, and this, Well, let me put it the way that Jesus put it. Here's what he says. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter into it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Wow. Everybody's not going to want this narrow, uh, want to go this narrow road. Everybody's not going to ask for forgiveness, no matter how, what the cost. Free. Free. You know, listen, we live in a society where there's some people who you, there's some stuff you can't give away. Because people are skeptical. Listen, you cut up some cheese right now at the Cracker Barrel, and there are people who are hungry, and the you know person has you know cheese out there, uh, you know, in their hand, and they're like offering free samples. But we we can be so skeptical. Uh, is it clean? You know, I mean, it free doesn't really sound like it, it. Nothing's really free, so we can get so skeptical in our own minds that no matter what the gift is, no matter what the price, no matter who's paid the price, there are people who will not want it. So that's a truth. Now, so in terms of like uh, the idea of, you know, being able to determine the, the idea that our salvation is predetermined, the idea that God is going to call everybody, many are called, but few are chosen. That's a truth. But let me give you some truths as well, because here's another truth. We don't know who's going to be saved or not. We, we don't know it. That's why our job as believers is to understand as much as we can about predestination, understand as much as we can about election. But the truth of the matter is who is elected and who is not is something that is beyond us. It's bigger than us. It's greater uh, than our pay grade. So we don't know who these people are that have been elected. We don't know who's been elected, who's not been elected. We don't, that's why we don't judge anyone's salvation. We can't do it. The truth of the matter is I guarantee you there are people who are saved that many people will trumpet their whole lives. I know he's not saved. If you would have looked at the thief on the cross, I'm sure that there's no one that would have thought that he would have heard the words this day, you'll be with me in paradise. There's no way that anybody would have thought that. Here's what we understand. Even as we're discussing this, and I hope that this answer helps you to understand how this actually works and that there are a couple senses there that yes, God is the only one who will determine salvation. But yes, we also have a choice. We also, uh, you know, make some choices. And one of the reasons, one of the things that it really tells us about us that we know on this side is that there are people who will have an opportunity to be saved who simply will reject it. There'll be no one who would have not had an opportunity that will burn in hell eternally that would not have selected hell over, uh, over heaven, that would not have selected death over life, would have not have chosen darkness over light. So when you look at this, the end of it all is that salvation is of the Lord. 
We don't know when he's going to come into somebody's life. We don't know what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, where he's going to do it. And at whatever point in someone's life that he's going to come in. Points that we, none of us as humans may, and other people may never see. So we don't judge salvation. But I can tell you what, I, it's important that you understand how salvation works. So I appreciate your question. And I really hope that this helps to really understand that the Lord is fair when it comes to offering everybody uh, an opportunity. But selecting only a few because of things that he knows internally about those few that you and I really will never, ever know. Hopefully that helps. Let's look at question number three. Again, we're kind of back floating along that same line. How can free will really exist if every single event in our lives is predetermined by God according to his plan? Again, I love these questions because I, I, I think that, you know, it takes a thinker. You know, and a skeptical thinker to actually think like a critical thinker to actually think like this. I'm not going to buy it unless I really get some answers. Great. I want you to buy it. I'm going to give you some answers. OK, so if free will is real and if it, I mean, if, if, if how in the world can it really exist if every event is predetermined? Well, first of all, I want you to understand free will. The concept is not is it's a concept. It's not something that you'll find scripturally. It's not it's not a word that's actually in the Bible where God says you have free will. No, but it, it is evident through scripture that free will does exist. The Trinity is not a word that you'll find in the in the Bible, right? You won't ever see it there. Yet Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? The the triune Godhead is clearly evident. Let us make man in our own image and own likeness. So we know that 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 there's three. We we understand that whole idea of triune or trinity means the three. So we've named something that is evident from scripture. Well let's talk about what free will actually means because it doesn't mean what we think it means. You know uh, the truth of the matter is free will simply means that we have a choice to love God or not. We have God has given us a choice to worship him or not. God has given us a choice whether we're going to obey him or not. That's really what free will is all about. We Our free will is, is free, but it's limited. Let me read something to you out of Deuteronomy, though, so you'll understand what this choice is all about. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says, This day I call the heavens and earth to witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Listen, this is God actually laying out before man a choice. That's where our will comes in. He says, listen, if you want to live, this is not about whether you want to buy a car, or whether you, you, know, you want to go to the left or to the right. This free will is really based upon the love of God. It's based, based upon... Our, the choices that we make concerning our worship and concerning uh, obedience. Listen, if you want to talk about absolute free will in the way we kind of look back and say, I, free will, I mean, if really free will means I can do whatever I want, but no, the truth be told, absolute free will is impossible because God is sovereign. It's, the, you know, the concept of humans having a total free will is not possible because you'd have to be equal to God. You'd, in order to have that, you'd have to be God. And since God is Lord and that he's sovereign and that all events are predetermined, and you're right, doesn't mean that we're that, that, that the events are established by God, doesn't mean that the events are coerced in any way by God, doesn't mean that because there's a predetermination, it doesn't mean that there's absolutely no free will. Listen, one of the things that we understand about will is that we choose according to our desires, right? That's scripturally what happens. God doesn't make us do anything. Free will exists even though the end result is actually fixed. Now, let me give you an example of this and how this could possibly work. How can I have free will and at the same time, you know, have uh, predetermination, predestination? How can those work together? Well, let's, let's say you're taking a test, right? And I, I'm, the, I'm the one who's giving the test, right? So that would put me in the place of God. And so just using this analogy, I'm not saying I'm God, but I just want to just say, I want to give you this analogy. I'm establishing that you have 30 minutes to come in here and to take this test. And you're going to take this test in the library, right? So the test is happening on the second floor in the library. I've determined that. And I've determined that you have 30 minutes to take the test. Now, here's the thing. That's what I've determined. Now, I've not determined that you have to actually take the test. 
I'm not determined that you are going, that you have to pass or fail the test. You have 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes is where you will exercise your free will. You can doodle if you want to. You can, you can, you can talk to other people. You can, you know, you can just look up in the sky. You can really seriously take this test. You can do lots of things, but the parameters are already set after 30 minutes. Test time is over. So what does that mean? It's on the test taker to determine the time, right? I've set the, the limits already, but in between that time, that 30 minutes, that's all yours. That's all you. Whatever you want to do within that time is all you. I set the end. In the end, whoever is going to pass this test, I actually already know who's going to pass it. But if you fail that test, there's absolutely no way you'd be able to look at God and say, listen, you made me fail it. You wanted me to fail it. No, I established that here's what people who are going to pass a test are going to do. I've already established they're going to get 80, 90 percent. And that's whatever, whatever the passing grade is. I've established that it's 85 percent. Right. Whatever that is. Now, you're free to study. You're free to take it seriously or not. You're free to get into that class and just put your pencil down and do nothing. So everything that within that 30 minutes is on the test taker. That's what free will is all about. So predetermination and free will actually complement each other. When something is predetermined, you're going to do this. The you know Israel is going to be here. Christians are going to be saved. Uh, all of those things are predetermined. But now some of the rocky places that we go to, some of the difficulty that we have, some of the, the traumas that we experience, those are not the will of God. Those are all on us. Those are our will. But when God is determined to save us, Paul's disobedience knocked him, you know, his, his attitude and his will got him knocked off his beast. His attitude and his will got him checked by Christ. But it was Jesus who had already determined before the foundation of the world, I'm going to use this guy, Paul, to do great works for me. He said that when Paul was blind. So predetermination and free will actually go hand in hand. And because there's predetermination, in no way means that there's a lack of free will. Let's just understand what free will is really all about. Mm -hmm. We've got to stay in a human place and never expect to be God. Let's take a look at this. Uh, and I'm going to show you something in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, before I leave here. It says, uh, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Check this last part out. Not wanting anyone to perish. That's God's desire. But everyone to come to repentance. Yet we know everyone will not. So when you look at predetermination, God is predetermined. Certain things, events are predetermined. Heaven and hell, who's going to be there? Predetermined. But our will has a lot to do with that. What we do within that 30-minute space, what we do within that space of our lifetime, it is appointed unto man once to die. So we know birth is God. Death is God. But what we do in between this time has a lot to do with us. And at the end of the test, it's determined that once you die, it's over. God has already said that. But he's given us this time while we live to take the test correctly and pass. Hopefully that helps that, uh, you know, when you begin to look at this, what you see here is that God is really giving us instruction on how to use our free will. I don't want any to perish. So I'm going to be patient with you. Right. So that you get it. I don't want any to perish. And those that perish will have to have literally decided not to take the test. Let's take a look at question number four. Again, thank you for your question. And I really hope this uh, helps. This one's, a, I mean, I like this question because it kind of brings us back to something we were talking about live at five, um, you know, and we, it's kind of topical because it's about the, uh, the Jewish nation, about the Jews. And, you know, we've heard a lot of that in the news. Um, so this is a discussion. This is a question I, I just received. It says, my friend is Jewish and says that Christians, Christians are inaccurate concerning who killed Jesus. Was it the Romans or are the Jews the people responsible for killing Jesus? Don't say we're responsible because of our sin. And then there's a funny face. So I got, got you. Don't come and say, well, you know, it's not the Jews responsible or not the Romans responsible, but it's really us. All of us and our sin has, you know, caused Jesus to have to die on the cross. Okay, that's true. You said don't say that. So I'm going to deal directly with your question. And the biblical record is really, really clear and is very, very specific about this, the answer to this question. 
there's absolutely no doubt concerning scripture uh, what that the religious leaders of Israel were the ones who were responsible for the death of Jesus. They were Jews, right? It was the Jews. Matter of fact, I, I won't say it. Let me let the scripture say, say it. This is Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 23. I, I'm, I'm not worried about being canceled. Uh, I don't have a big uh, Adidas deal, so I can say whatever I want. And if I had a big Adidas deal, guess what? I'm free. I can say whatever I want. It says, uh, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, this is this is talking, he says, this is talking to the Pharisees, right? The, the, the religious leaders of the day. But now this is also talking to the whole house of Israel. And it says, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's go, let's go a little bit further. It says, so the chief priests and Pharisees gathered counsel together and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, you know, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for, for that one man should die for the people that the whole, rather than the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation kind of going the long way, but I want to get down to this. And not for the nation only, but for the whole of the children of God who are scattered abroad. This is really the crux of it, though. It says, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. This is scripture. From that point on, the Pharisees, the leaders of the councils, the religious leaders of that day made a point that they were going to bring Jesus to death. One more. First Thessalonians chapter two, for fourteen through fifteen. For you, brothers and sisters, become imitators of God, of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same thing; those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone. Listen. Go throughout the Gospels. Go throughout the the letters, and what you'll find is that they are explicit. And they are in, they they are implicit as well that the Jews were not allowed to punish um, the, the they weren't allowed to punish anyone guilty of blasphemy with death. They could not exercise the death penalty. We know that they had to prevail upon what Scripture shows us is a very reluctant Roman government to actually do it. You don't believe me? It, it, it's Gospel of John, 1831. It says, and Pontius Pilate said to them, this is the Roman governor. He says, take them yourselves and judge them according to your own law. And then it says, then, then the Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. And then the assembled members of the Jewish community told Pilate, they said, his blood be on us and on our children. Now, clearly, we know that the, the they didn't the, the Jews didn't have the power of the death penalty. They couldn't themselves put Jesus to death, but they brought him to the right mechanism, that which was the Roman government that could crucify him, and they trumped up the charges to make sure that it would be a death penalty case. So the biblical view is clear that the Jews were responsible for the for Jesus' death. Now, it, it is the Jews who insist that you know that Jesus would die they insist that he is guilty while Pontius Pilate actually says I find no fault in this man I wash my hands of this whole thing this is on you that's what Pontius Pilate said he throws the ball back the Jews catch it and they never throw it back again they say listen we're keeping this ball I'm, I'm we caught this pass this the blood of this man be on us. They said it. They took it on themselves. So the question is really clear. You know, this is not being anti-Semitic. This is not, you know, trying to pile on on the Jews. This is just true. You know, sometimes that there, you know, many of many of us and as individuals, as you know, in many of us in groups don't like negativity. We don't like anybody saying something, you know, negative about us or something, you know, that doesn't put us in the right light. But here's the thing. What's true is true. You know, if there's something good to be said about you, we're going to say that. And we need to say that. But if there's something negative, all people, all groups of people have to be able to face the truth. And you're not necessarily being anti-Semitic if you say something that is simply true, that can be proven. 
that is not something that is based upon conspiracy theories. That's not something that's based upon hatred. That is simply based upon the historical record, based upon fact. And the historical record and the facts of the case make it very clear. And the people who spoke these words were Jews. The writers of the Bible were Jews. And guess what the Jews said about themselves? They said, listen, we're not, we're Christians now. You guys were the ones who killed Jesus. You were the ones, you Jews, were the ones who actually crucified him. And you also were the ones who kicked us out. So when you look at this, I want to make it clear, you know, for you, as you're going to present this, um, you know, to your friend, that this is not something uh, that Christians are being inaccurate about. This is something that Christians are being extremely accurate about and are simply following what is the clear biblical record. Hopefully that helps there and doesn't cause too many uh, issues for you. Let's look at our fifth and our final question. And here's what it is. It says, in your view, and I like that, it's my view, in your view, how should believers respond to people who make fun of our faith in Christ? I think we're getting too soft. Yeah, you want to put the dukes up, right? You want, how dare they, you know, say something about my faith? How dare they come against my church? How dare they come against my pastor? My job is to defend my church. My job is to defend my pastor. My job is to defend my religion or my denomination. You know, all of those things. You know, the Bible says to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have, but we also don't operate out of emotion. We're, you know, we can't make decisions out of emotion. And I want you uh, who asked this question, I want you to remember that very same thing. Your decisions can't be made out of emotion. Listen, I get it. You know, I, mean, I get it. And I want you to re really look at what soft is and really just make sure you're defining soft and defining hard and defining right and defining wrong, not based upon how you feel, not based upon the things that you want to do. Turning on the cheek is a hard thing. Yeah, I can guarantee you that. And so it's not a difficult thing. And sometimes it can make us feel uh, like we're weak, especially, you know, with men. You know, we want to uh, be right. Sometimes we want to make sure we, if we get pushed. We want to push back. But listen, as a believer, we are supposed to always show kindness. It's hard. We're supposed to always show courtesy. That's hard. And guess what? We're also supposed to respect people even when people are making fun of us, when people are clowning what we believe, when people are mocking openly. Maybe other people are laughing about it. You know, they're make, making us look bad, making us look weak, if you will. Uh, but we're supposed to still respect them and, and respect them to such an extent that we don't disrespect ourselves, that we don't make the gospel a uh, uh, shipwreck and that we don't really put a stain upon the image of Christ, which we bear. We are image bearers. So, you know, when people are mocking and, and insulting and are just, you know, outright rude to us and are rude about our faith, guess what? We're not supposed to be rude to them. We're not supposed to hit back, you know, and well, listen, you said that about me. I can say that about you. Here's the answer. You don't actually have to respond. When someone's making fun of something, your job, you don't have to respond. Your job is not to, you know, defend poor Jesus in heaven. You know, somebody just made a joke about him. You, you got to defend him. No, that, that's not what we do. Here's what we do. Here's what Jesus commanded us to do. I want you to pray for those. I want you to pray for those people that are, are, are mocking you. I want you to pray for those people who are actually mocking God. And I want you to hope for them that one day they'll find truth. One of the reasons why they're mocking uh, and, and, you know, and making fun is because they don't know the truth. And what you should have, instead of animus and anger, what you should really have is pity for people who simply don't understand the things that are, that, that, that pertain to their salvation, the things that God really wants for them to have. Listen, pick your battles. There, listen, there are times now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing cookie cutter here. There are moments where we are defenders of the faith, where we are defending the faith. Not because somebody mocked and somebody made fun and somebody made somebody laugh. No, there's opportunities to witness. There's opportunities to actually defend a point that might be a blessing to other people. That somebody says, well, how can this be? And there's moments where people think, listen, this is stupid, but you may have an answer that will not only refute that, because Paul, the Bible says he debated with the Greeks day and night. That he loved it, they loved it, and they and even when he left, you know they they said, you know we would hear more of this. We we want to really hear a little bit more about about this this unknown God that you're talking about. So what you have to do is you got to pick your battles. Listen, if somebody's mocking the Lord, if somebody's you know mocking your 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 faith, if somebody's you know mocking church or you know mocking a particular preacher that you, you may like, 
um, you got to pick your battles. You know, if people are just, if they're doing it with anger, if they're doing it, whether there could be violence, if they're doing it where it's irrational uh, insults that are just going out there. Listen, there's no point in doing that. There's no point in jumping into that fray and jumping into that battle because you don't have an opportunity for someone's mind to be changed. And that's what's there. So what do we do? You say we're kind of getting soft here. What do we do? Well, here's what you do. You live the light. That's what you do. Turning the other cheek is living the light. Listen, I want to give them a word. They don't want to hear the word. Well, they'll see the word. You know, they, you, listen, whatever happens, they, everybody needs to get the word of God. Sometimes they need to hear the word from your mouth. Sometimes they'll need to see it in your life. You know, let your light shine before men. What does the Bible say? When they see it. When they actually see this, like when people who are laughing and mocking and they actually see how you handle this, that this isn't like embarrassment, embarrassment where you just got to have your head down. You know, man, I, oh, this isn't like, oh, I'm seething. I wish it, I, Jesus would just let me loose. If he wasn't in front of me right now, I would. If, if it, it's not about that. If they can see that you still, your confidence is in the Lord. Clearly, nothing has been shaken. If they can see that you actually have pity, that your, your, your face hasn't changed, your countenance has not fallen that you really look at the other person and that you are really looking at them and recognizing what they are lost, what they've lost, what they are lacking, what they need. If you're looking, if they see that and they realize you ain't no pushover, you're nobody's punk, but you are, you're somebody's child. You're a child of the king. So turning the other cheek is actually living the light. Let me, let me give you this first, and I want you to get this. It says, this is John 15. It says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. You, you hear that? It hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. Get that? You're out of the world. Chosen out of the world. That really connects to so many things that have been asked before. So I hope some of the people are still on because I want you to see that word. I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Listen, some of this stuff we have to take. Some of this, you know, some of the persecution, we're looking at some way to stop it. And the Lord says, listen, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you and it's not going to stop. Persecution is not going to stop. There's going to be great persecution in our lives, right? There's going to be persecution in this world. Christ promised that. He told us that. That's actually what's going to happen. So, you know, the idea that we're going to change everybody's opinion, that we're going to change everybody's mind, no. But you know what you can do? You can be an example all the time. That's your job. That's the role you have. Not to control them. Your role is to control you. You are to be under control. You are to operate in that ninth fruit of the spirit, which is self-control. So I want you to control yourself. I want you to recognize you're on. That I don't know if this is actually happening to you now, if there's situations you've seen other people, but I don't want you to look and say, if that were me, I would have let him have it. If that was me, I'd have them laughing at him by the end of it. If that were me, I would make him look stupid. We're not designed here to make other people look stupid. We're not designed. I'm not, I'm not here to get into a debate with a Mormon or with a, you know, with a Muslim or with a Buddhist. And so with the, with the hope that at the end of it all, I look like a genius and they look like a bunch of idiots. That they look like a bunch of unstudied, unlearned morons. Like that, maybe that's my goal. No, my goal is that they will see the love of Christ in me and that somehow through the miraculous gift of God, that they will move from darkness into light. So what I want you to do today is I want you to enjoy the blessings of God in your life. I want you to enjoy the fact that you are a believer, that you know the truth, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and that you are sealed until the day of redemption. But I also want you to pray for those who are ignorant of the things that pertain to their peace. That's what Jesus did. He looked up, up on the people who were going to and fro, and he didn't take, pick up a stone, you know, as he was looking down and throw it over there and say, let me see if I can hit one of those idiots. But one of those people who are walking in darkness, he says, no, I see him as sheep without a shepherd. And I would have gathered them together as a mother gathered her hens, gathered her chicks under her wings. He says, but they would have none of it. And guess what? Jesus wept. He didn't look at it and say, I'm going to go down there and make them look stupid. You know, he didn't say, I'm going to go down there and force my opinion upon them. You know what he was doing? He was praying. And even on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
listen, when you hear this mockery, I don't want you to hear, you know, a witty uh, retort. I don't want you. I don't want you to hear somebody who's got a lot of skill and, and wisdom in their words. I don't want you to hear a comedian. Maybe somebody's funny. I want you to hear someone who's ignorant of the offer that's greater than just making a few people laugh. They're making a few people laugh at the expense of living forever. You, that you, you should pity that. And not be angry about that. So listen, I think it's for us to get our heads together and to realize we've got to stay mission focused. Stay focused on the mission that God has given you to be a light to the world. And don't let somebody's jokes and anger and, and their, their, their acrimony against the truth snuff your light out. You continue to burn regardless. And guess what? There's a promise. Some people are going to watch your light. And maybe not your words, maybe not your witty comeback. They'll watch your light and they'll see it. They'll know it's from God and they'll glorify your father, which is in heaven, which is what you want. I hope that helps you. Listen, we're at the end of our live at five. This has been, listen, this is always a blessing. I constantly want to make sure you guys are aware how thankful I am of you for you continually sending these questions in. It sharpens me. It allows me to learn some things and to think about some things that I had not thought about. Listen, I've got to go back to the drawing board often, many times, as a result of what you guys are, are, are asking. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So I'm getting sharpened by you asking these questions, by you wanting to know more about the things of the Spirit and wanting to know more of the things that pertain to God and the things of God. So listen, keep it coming. We're going to be here every Wednesday at 5 o'clock sharp, making sure that your questions are getting answered directly from the Holy Ghost, straight from the Revelation train, directly to your household so that you can walk in the light. We'll be back here again at seven o'clock, always uh, at seven o'clock on Wednesday. You know, you know what time it is. It's time for Pastor Noise. Elder Hightower and myself uh, have a podcast. We're going to see it on YouTube. We're doing some things. We're doing some retooling. So you're going to be seeing some, some, uh, some, some, different things that we're going to be moving into YouTube. We're going to be moving uh, much, much heavier presence in many areas of social media. So we want to make sure that we put together something that is going to be informative, that you're going to learn from, but also interactive. We want you to be a part of it. So as we're growing and as we're working it and, and, you know, retooling it, we want your ideas. We want some ideas about some topics that you want to talk about, some things you want to learn about, some things you don't know about, or some things you know about you want to know more about. Some things you may be disturbed about, some things that are a little noisy. And part of what we want to do here uh, at Pastor Noise is just that. We want to get past the noise. So we're here at 5 o'clock for Live at 5 to give you biblical answers. But at 7 o'clock, these are topics that we want to, that, that are in our world, the world we share. We don't all share the kingdom. Every person is not going to be a part of the kingdom. But all of us are in the world even though we're not of the world. So we want to talk about what's going on in this world around us. We want to break down some things that, that, are, that are going on. We've got, you know, Confederate monuments that are, that are being taken down or, and that have been established hundreds of years ago. But we need to really look at that. We're going to talk about a little bit about that tonight and about some of these monuments and why we do it, why we build monuments to ourselves in the first place. And it's maybe the, the, the answer to all of that is that we, maybe we need to stop building monuments to ourselves. Maybe we missed what happened in the Tower of Babel and, and what building monuments to man does to man. So listen, come back at 7 o'clock. Love to see you. Check out the Facebook page, Pass the Noise. Go to our YouTube page, Pass the Noise. You're going to see us on TikTok. You're going to, I mean, we, we, listen, we're about to really, really explode in this place, but we need your help. So listen, we want you to be a part of it. We want you to be a part of everything that we're doing. Stay here every Wednesday, Wednesday at 5 o'clock so that you can get educated. Because as I always say, the most, I think the most effective believer is an educated believer. God bless you and have an awesome Wednesday.